Well, good afternoon, everyone. I hope you had a chance to look at the uh, nice interviews that we had with so many people. Uh, we had asked them to tell about how they affect the patient experience. And if you didn't get a chance to read some of these that we just put up uh, on the screen, they'll actually be on, on the website. But that's really what the theme is going to be about today. How do I connect to the vision of UTMB and its future? And I wanted to read a letter to really start this that I received from a patient that I think really shows the importance of what we're doing every day. I was a patient at UTMB visiting for my well woman exam and I was overdue for my mammogram. After the exam, I came to the front desk and checked out and mentioned that I needed to schedule an appointment for a mammogram. The, PC, the patient service specialist said she would call downstairs and see if she could get me in that day, but I replied I needed to get back to work. Encouraging me to get it done, she said, just let me try to get you in today and then you won't have to come back for another appointment. Although I hesitated, she immediately called radiology. Someone could see me right away, so I went and had my mammogram. I got my results and found out that I had breast cancer. If it hadn't been for you, I would have put that off. I want to thank you for your persistent attitude and thinking about the patient first. UTMB is fortunate to have people like you. There are many stories across our organization that are just like that, where someone has either knowingly made a difference in someone's life, or sometimes you're not at the front lines so much, but you make a difference. And what we want to talk today about is how you do make that difference. And I want you, as we go through this presentation, to be thinking about how do I connect to the patient care part of the mission? How does what I do make a difference to patients like that, that uh, patient service specialist made to that particular patient today. So with that, we're going to look at the, some of the goals I set last year. Remember last year, we talked about the vision 2018 for the health system. If we could write a story, paint a picture of what UTMB would be like in 2018, what would the health system be like? We're going to go back and revisit some of those goal statements, and we're going to look at what we've done so far this year that really is a great deal we've accomplished in moving toward that vision, moving toward accomplishing those goals. And then I'm going to also show you a little bit, give you a glimpse into the future about what we're going to do next year um, at a very high level to continue to achieve those goals. And then, of course, there'll be time for questions. So last year, I showed you that the current demands of an academic um, health system require much more integration. And on the left, you saw a health system, an academic enterprise, and institutional support having points of intersection, but much more or many more decisions being made kind of on the outskirts of those uh, connecting circles. We said we need to become more and more integrated, and although there will still be things that we will do as a health system or an academic enterprise or institutional support that may not have that great degree of overlap, more and more of our work will. And it matters because we can't make decisions in isolation. A decision I make today may affect my good friend, Dr. Jacobs, and if he's not aware, if I'm running the health system as if it were a silo, uh, we could be off to the races down uh, divergent paths, spending a lot of money, time, people, time, resources, and all of a sudden realize that that wasn't really, we didn't want up to be on the path I'd chosen or the path Dr. Jacobs had chosen, but had we talked, we would have probably picked a different path that would have made a lot more difference to UTMB. So what's this emphasis on teamwork going to require? So for us who are managers, leaders, it means we have to be more inclusive. We have to think when we start something, who else is this going to impact? Who else in the organization will this impact? Who should I be talking to? Who should I be including as I move forward in this work? That 
also requires much better communications, and you'll see some things that have uh, we've done in response to things you're telling us about that. And it requires us as managers to be more flexible. For the physicians, uh, nurses, and employees, it's going to require us to be more proactive in who else do we need to include. And so that whole theme of inclusion uh, goes even farther. So rather than, if you're like I am, I bet if I said how many of you are results oriented, most all of you, if not all of you in this room would raise your hands, but it's going to require us to think about that a little bit more. We articulated a very lofty vision about what the health system would be like in 2018, and we said UTMB Health is a patient-centered, highly reliable, value-driven organization the first choice in the region for patients, payers, and businesses, and a state and national leader in healthcare delivery. And we said that was lofty because we knew, just like any other healthcare organization, we have a ton of work to do. And some of you, how many of you feel we've been doing a ton of work this past year? <laughs> and guess what? <laughs> how many of you think there'll be a ton of work to do next year? <laughs> exactly. It's just, you know, healthcare is different today than maybe when you or I entered it, or if you're just coming into the healthcare field or starting your profession, uh, this may seem normal to you. Um, and good, because I think this is, uh, to some extent, the new normal. Um, we also said that this vision included expanding our service delivery to other sites is critical for the future. And we've really couched that expansion in trying to look at how can we assure that patients in underserved areas have access to physicians? And we believe access to our physicians and our staff is even more important because we know what we can bring to a community in terms of better care. And we also said that as we've redesigned care delivery models, we've moved from asking the patient what matters to asking the patient what matters most to you. And we've fully embraced being patient-centric by engaging patients and their families in their care. And we're going to talk about that today, too. So I'm going to do a brief run-through, and by the time I just get through this section, we're all going to be exhausted. But we're extending our brand because we're extending access to good UTMB care in areas that are underserved, meaning there aren't enough physicians in that geographic area, that zip code, if you will, to deliver the care you would expect for that population. So in the last 12 months, here comes the race. We have opened a neurosciences critical care unit with eight beds. We originally staffed for four. We've had an average daily census for neuro of 3.53. We have used at times that area for a bit of overflow but now we can provide very focused, intensive care for neurosurgery and neurology patients, and all of the rooms are capable of monitoring the patient. Uh, we have a rapid decision unit, and we, put 10, uh, we have 10 beds located near the emergency department. We now use those and staff them, and you'll see the staff here, that are used for evaluation and treatment of patients who require further testing before we decide, does this patient need to be admitted or not? Very important, because we don't want to admit people if they don't really need that admission, but sometimes we need a little bit more information to make that decision. So we're doing that in a little bit different way now, and um, that's going well. We put in an epilepsy monitoring unit, and you'll see uh, the technician here uh, who is monitoring uh, these patients on a 24 by 7 basis, not him alone, although some days it may feel like that. Uh, we've had 72 admissions to date. We have three beds and one monitoring room. We opened an urgent care at Victory Lakes, and this was a great example of using overhead you already have. So Victory Lakes had a specialty clinic in orthopedics that ran, you know, pretty much until 6 every evening x-ray technology right connected to that clinic, what do you need when you open an urgent care? Other than the staff and physicians, of course, you need rooms, exam rooms, and you need usually x-ray and ability to draw a lab. Why would we create it anywhere else? We're using space we already have now. Uh, it's open Monday through Friday from 6 to 10 p.m. and on the weekends from 10 a.m. to 8 p.m. We've had 
over 6,400 patient visits now. We're seeing pediatric and adult patients, and it has been a wonderful example of collaboration because uh, orthopedic uh, folks said, you know, as long as, uh, you know, we're able to finish our clinics, which we will do by six, then you can use, I mean, you're able to use that space, and isn't that great because it's all UTMB space, but we're using it, starting to think about using it for multiple purposes. We also opened a sports injury clinic um, during the fall. Why during the fall? Hmm, football. Right, and, kids, and then we found there were lots of other, we were doing it because of the football games and thinking football players, but we've treated cheerleaders, we've treated people with cross-country injuries. Uh, but what we found was that patients loved, parents loved in particular, that ability to access this uh, special clinic for sports injury on Saturday mornings. It's much more patient-centric, and we're now looking at do we want to uh, extend that and do that uh, more than uh, the simply uh, football season, basically. Now we're going to open some other things that are needed for us to extend this brand, extend the access. In Alvin, we have a clinic that will be opening. Um, uh, this is going to be a 10,000 square foot building. If you're familiar with um, six, uh, uh, Highway, well, US 35 and Highway 6, if you're familiar with it on the south, East side is a new raceway gas station. Some of you are nodding your heads. There's a whole bunch of land right next to it. So this clinic will go there. It's going to relocate clinics that we currently have uh, that are community-based clinics, uh, pediatrics in Alvin, and we're going to add adult primary care, running it as a, uh, the community-based uh, clinic model. And we will put radiology there, too, so that, that the patients don't have to go to the doctor and then go somewhere else for radiology. And we're projecting this to have about 15,000 annual visits. Texas City, we're uh, planning another clinic well underway. And it, I put the opening dates. Uh, this one will be in the fall of 2014, 35,000 square feet at the corner of Emmett Lowry Feeder. And it's going to relocate and consolidate all the existing Texas City clinics, which makes us more efficient, and then uh, to also add uh, urology and ENT will be in there, pediatrics, adult internal medicine, and family medicine, and then we're adding cardiology and ophthalmology, and we're projecting 55,000 visits per year. The really exciting thing is that, do you remember me talking about the Medicaid 1115 waiver that Texas got that allows us to do some demonstration projects around better ways to deliver care? Well, one of those projects is a teaching clinic so that we can teach our residents and students in uh, family and internal medicine a better, the patient-centered medical home approach to caring for patients, and this is where a team of uh, physicians and staff and nurses work together with the same set of patients, each with their own defined role, to provide care to those patients. We're going to do that in our own adult clinics. Uh, we're already doing it in family medicine. We know that's a great way to deliver care to patients and to optimize the use of the physician and the nurses and so forth, but we said, well, we should be training. We're a training institution. We should be training our students and residents in that. So Dr. McCollum and others put together a proposal, Dr. Lieberman, um, to put a 4,500-square-foot teaching clinic um, in Texas City, and we anticipate in the first year 2,000 visits. Um, how many of you have been watching uh, the precast sides go up on the Jenny Seeley and the CSF? That's a... I was watching that thinking, I'm glad I'm not one of the, I, I, have, I don't like heights, and I'm watching these workmen, work women, lean out over the railing and start pulling in this big piece of precast that's hanging from the end of one of those cranes. Well, anyway, it's coming along really well, and so people who work in food service and pharmacy and laboratory services, materials management, and sterile processing are going to be in new uh, space. In addition, we were fortunate to, again, get the generous support of the Celia and Smith Foundation to help us build out uh, a good 
part of our, our labs, what we had identified we wanted in phase one. We also have the new Jenny Seeley Hospital. Those of us on campus see this going up every day, but it's going to have the 310 patient rooms, 58 IC room, ICU rooms are included in that, and then 20 operating rooms. And we've gone through on many occasions the reason this is so important. It'll consolidate all of our adult uh, acute care and ICU beds on the same, uh, in the same building. And then uh, we're going to, after our, we open that, we're going to open the 61st Street. In the winter of 2015, right before we open Jenny, we're going to be opening the 61st Street Pediatric Clinic, which will consolidate. Uh, it's going to go on a pad site in front of the Home Depot, very visible, uh, but we're going to add more pediatric primary care there and relocate the urgent care to that space. Um, in September of 2015, we're going to do the Victory Lakes expansion. Um, have any of you seen that going up? I mean, it's just every time I go by, uh, I mean, it's almost all enclosed. It's really going up quickly. And this will be able to help us serve our patients that, are in, that live in and around that League City area. And then we also got generous support from the Seeley and Smith Foundation uh, for a 30,000 square foot uh, clinic with possible expansion if needed to uh, 90,000 square feet. Um, if you know where Randall's is on 61st Street, the, the, at the stoplight at the corner, that's Central City Boulevard. Well, if you turn there, there's a whole bunch of land behind Randall's. That's how I uh, <laughs> figured out where it was. And they're going to help us develop that for our patients um, on the island. We also have then, when we leave the John Seeley Hospital Towers, uh, we're going to develop women, infants, and children, and special units, uh, some that we're looking at, psychiatry, rehab, palliative care, we're gonna do some business planning around that. Uh, but we will leave those in the Jenny, or the John Seeley Hospital and reconfigure, uh, modernize the rest of those uh, spaces for these uh, important populations of patients. And we're going to have to do that at the same time uh, they'll be addressing the facade uh, repair that's needed on the John Seeley Hospital. Uh, so that's going to be a logistical uh, intri intricacy that will, I'm sure, be a marvel uh, when our wonderful facilities people work with us and try to figure out how that's all going to be done. Last year, we said, Part of the vision was that care delivery has changed, that patients and employees can access all of their care at UTMB. So what have we done toward that? Well, we have, I see Dr. Urban in the audience today, and he and many others, including Deb McGrew and Mark Kirschbaum, have been working on how do we, um, how do we remodel or redesign the inpatient service for internal medicine? And honestly, this is pioneering work that we're, that we're doing right now. But we think when this uh, new model goes into place that it's going to improve the experience for uh, all of our patients uh, on the internal medicine service. And so we're excited about that work. It fits with that vision. We also received a Level 3 National Committee for Quality Assurance Certification for all of our three family medicine practice sites, and we're planning on extending that to other primary care clinics. Good news is we're certified. The other news that we're trying to figure out what it means is what does that mean exactly in terms of is that going to get us any more payment because generally it hasn't yet, but what it means for our patients is a team of people who are working with me who, when I call, if my doctor isn't there, there's another doctor that they partner with that knows me, or the nurse knows me, or the PSS knows me. It's really talking about teams of people who know me, and that helps to create that sense of continuity, not that every time I come, I'm seeing somebody different. And part of the model for the uh, internal medicine redesign is to try to make the residents that are assigned to some of those services consistent. In chronic care management, we've been doing work in partnership with Blue Cross Blue Shield on our diabetic patients. 
uh, under development now is our next uh, cohort of uh, chronic uh, disease patients that we're going to work with, and Dr. Sharma is leading this effort for chronic obst obstructive pulmonary disease, COPD, that you probably hear about on commercials a lot on the television. Uh, we've also done some things to help us be better prepared for population health management. So I, I know that there are certain things, given my age, that every year or every five years that I should be getting. And what this is going to do is help to develop registries so if I should be getting a certain care, if I should be seeing the doctor, if I should be reporting uh, blood results, uh, this registry is going to help me understand who, in my patient population who received the care that they should be given versus who hasn't, so I can be proactive and call. And someone can call me and say, Donna, it's time for whatever it is that I need. Uh, that's a huge, huge uh, issue because if we can give you the care you need outside of the hospital and keep you out of the hospital, that's really the goal of accountable care. And so that's what we're working toward. We also were part of the Medicaid waiver that I just told you about. We had 28 delivery system reform innovation uh, payments that were uh, uh, basically programs that were developed under this where we get to try what we think will be a good way of caring for patients in the future um, and be able to monitor and track it and if we meet certain goals that we set and that were agreed to by the state and by the federal government, we get payments for that. All of these, almost all of these projects are related to improving patient care delivery. So we have one around palliative care and establishing a service uh, for that. We have another one, extending our care to nursing homes and long-term care facilities where we know we send our patients upon discharge and oftentimes they, they come back because if we had been able to manage them at that other setting, we probably would not have had to have them come back. Some will, but uh, we're finding when we look at the number of patients that come back after discharge, within 30 days, we know we're going to get penalized for that on the Medicare side and other payers, including Medicaid's already followed suit. So we need to be able to address uh, that, and one of the projects is going to allow us to do it. We also, um, are looking at new partners for extending our brand and extending access. And so I'm sure you heard that we signed a letter of intent with Angleton Danbury Medical Center uh, to basically uh, have some type of agreement. We think it will be a lease agreement is what we're looking at right now for a long period of time. We're thinking maybe 10 years uh, where we will uh, manage uh, that particular medical center and the employees will become UTMB and we will be able to extend the care but more importantly uh, help them address some of the shortages of uh, health care workers particularly physicians in that area and be able to give those people living in their own community better access to care. Uh, several of us spent a uh, good part of two days uh, recently visiting with the staff and with their volunteer group and with their board and uh, others and talking about how this might work and everybody is uh, in Angleton Danbury is really looking forward to this. They view UTMB as a good partner for the future. We want to find other ways to do that in other settings so that we are managing a large set of patients across a geographic uh, location. We also use technology. I saw Todd Leach here. He and his folks are really tired this year because uh, we expanded my chart. We've uh, implemented Epic Care, uh, Epic Care Link for our referring physicians. I'm a referring physician. I send Donna to the hospital, and I can actually, through a secure portal, to see just my patients log in, and I know what's being ordered for Donna today. I know the tests she's gotten, the results she's gotten. A great way to, for referring physicians to stay in communication and know what's happening. And so when I show up again in their office, they don't say, well, Donna, what happened? I haven't heard anything. 
So this will, and it's safer, it's better for patients. Uh, we have also put in preventive care prompts for clinic visits, and we did, uh, how many of you were in some way, shape, or form involved in UTMB Connect? A lot of people, that's right. And so this is the one, one record, one bill approach. So all of a patient's clinical information is in the EPIC electronic health record, and their bill is on a single statement that includes everything, whether it was tests, uh, hospital charges, or physicians, it's all on the same bill. And uh, that's been different for our patients. Summon Smith and her staff will tell you that we've had to do patient education around that, but overall it's being received very well. We also said to become more patient-centric, we have to do better in our quality outcomes. And remember last year I said no outcome, no income? Not no margin, no mission. It's now, if you don't have the outcomes, many payers are starting to take away income from us uh, if we don't meet certain thresholds. So we've been doing work on um, patient satisfaction, or now HCAPs, and let me just pause for a little uh, brief explanation. We used to use Press Ganey, right? Remember that? Now, wait, Press Ganey runs this, but the questions look somewhat different, and we are monitoring how we perform on HCAPs, which is the federal government's way of measuring patient satisfaction, and they're basically eight questions that they look at. So we're, we're looking at what's our performance on HCAPs because that's where the financial penalties come in if we don't perform at certain levels. So far, we haven't had any uh, funds taken away for patient satisfaction. And the good news is, as you look at this, in each area, we have improved some year over year. We're going to have to continue to make those improvements. Uh, continue to make sure that our patients are feeling well served. In some other measures, we've got work to do, and we've done some great work around sepsis, we've done some great work around mortality, uh, but we have many teams, I imagine a number of people in here are involved in some of this work. I know I saw Chuck Mockner was here, I saw him. He's been involved with the uh, ICUs and physicians on looking at, there he is, how we, can better, uh, how we can better identify a patient at risk for sepsis and implement a certain number of protocols or a certain step of, of steps in a protocol that will help us to uh, help that patient avoid uh, going into septic shock or having sepsis, which has uh, a high risk for, for death. And so we believe, and literature shows you can, through a series of interventions early enough, be able to uh, stop that and reverse that course. Uh, we also been focused on 30-day all-cause readmissions. I just put that in red because there's more work we have to do. Good news is we're improving, um, and more news is we have more work to do. Uh, if we look at all of our core measures, our hand hygiene, we're making nice progress there. Um, I know Dr. Jacobs continually says, Donna, hand hygiene should be 100%. We should all wash our hands. And uh, we had a long discussion about that. Uh, we decided, though, let's make us, let's, let's set the goals so they're achievable, so we're feeling successful. And I'm glad to see that we are making improvement. And then the core measures, these are the four areas, uh, AMIs, heart failure, pneumonia, and surgical care improvement uh, project. All of those were doing well. Uh, we have done really well. We need to smooth it out so the performance is consistent as we go month to month, quarter to quarter, and we don't see that little jaggedy line that we're starting to see here. So we keep our performance at the highest possible level. So what we're working on here is trying to sustain the improvement at the levels we know we can achieve because we've already achieved those. Uh, I talked about Medicare dollars at risk. This slide basically says that when we look at the dollars we had at risk from Medicare, so they have us withhold, they withhold from us a certain payment, and then at the end of the year we have to earn it back based on our performance, those HCAPS measures and um, some of the quality measures. 
including readmissions, um, we so far have been able to earn back about $72,000, uh, earn it back plus plus seventy-two. dollars So we've actually done a little better. We earn more than was withheld. So we earn back the withhold plus a little bit. We need to stay, again, ahead of that curve. In infection control, we've done a lot of work, and I wanted to recognize people uh, like the PICU, the uh, burn uh, intensive care unit and TDCJ, uh, they have gone longer than a year without a central line associated bloodstream infection. And kudos, that takes a lot of effort. And you know what? That's good for the patients. We're more patient centered, just like that vision said. Um, on, uh, we've in other areas had only one or two or three, and they're working hard to bring that down to zero. Catheter-associated infections, uh, look at that performance. Some of the areas have had none for um, one almost three years, one almost two years. So again, kudos uh, to the folks in the ICUs who I know are working really, really hard to make sure that we keep our patients uh, safe and recovering uh, when we can. This is some exceptional work that I just wanted to highlight. We, uh, the folks in the emergency department and heart services decided, what if we partnered with EMS, the folks in Galveston that bring us the patients in the ambulance, what if we partnered with them, developed a protocol that we implemented so they could start some work when they were bringing the patient here, and we were alerted uh, in advance, so the minute they hit the door, that we could take them on to, uh, uh, basically, to get the CT. We reduced uh, the time to scan for stroke from 20 minutes to two minutes. Folks, um, Dr. Callender knows I don't like billboards, but <laughs> this is worthy of a billboard. <laughs> I mean, that is incredible performance. I see a lot of the people here today who've been working hard on that. So again, uh, kudos to you because you figured out how to partner with another critical set of people outside of the UTMB system, but for all intents and purposes, they're working with us to deliver good patient care, and they came up with a way to do it. This is really tremendous work. And I did ask uh, the gentleman who is on the gurney, when I saw it at first, I said, that's not a patient, is it? Because I want to make sure we were protecting confidentiality. But this was uh, the CMS uh, educator from Galveston, Tommy Lee. We have gotten tons of awards this year to recognize the great work. Again, showing we're patient-centered. I have a uh, sheet that was available to you uh, at the beginning of this session that looks like this. And the print's getting smaller and smaller. I think I'm going to have to have Dr. Godley tell me when, when have I gotten it so small that no one, even with 2020 vision, could read all this. But it lists the vast majority of these awards. I, I'm not, I hope I don't slight anyone because everybody's working hard. But we did get the AHA get with the guidelines. Uh, Resuscitation Silver Quality Achievement Award. We were third place in the UT System Annual Clinical Safety and Effectiveness uh, Conference. They have awards. Uh, we got them for improving sepsis mortality. And we also received for that work the Texas Hospital Association Bill Aston Award for Quality. Huge achievement. And then we got the CSNE third place award for increasing physician reporting of patient safety events that Dr. Lindsay Sonstein and others worked on. We were one of four uh, organizations in Texas to, re, uh, to receive the AACN Gold Level Beacon Award, and we had a celebration around that. Our ICU folks were there, and uh, Surgical ICU, and they received the award. But it was so fun to be there because so many of them said, so many of the other folks in the ICUs and other areas were working on this. We want, to, we want our unit to have that same. So it's just this, this sense of we're going to get better that just comes roaring through. We said we were going to be efficient, important to payers and businesses. We're going to approach the 25th percentile of cost in all areas. What have we done? 
We did lean training this year, 25% of our managers. Our goals next year say 25% more managers. We have been using throughout the budget process of benchmarking data as we determine how do we allocate our dollars and how do we make sure that we are trying to consistently achieve certain types of metrics. And I know Deb McGrew led that effort in the budget process, but everybody participated and we appreciate that. We also, the big, big, big for me achievement this year in efficiency was the tremendous work that the OR did um, led by David Marshall, Bud Cherry, and so many others, uh, all those people in that picture, that re uh, we achieved incredible results in our OR performance. I'm not going to go through every one, but look at uh, percent of on-time start wheels in to the OR improved from 19% to 85%. Really? That's amazing. How good is that for patients? You know, when I'm on that gurney and I can't eat or drink anything, I'm ready to get this over with, folks. You know, so great. They're being a lot more efficient. They've uh, improved our block utilization time uh, from 68% to 80%. We've increased, uh, we've completed our prime time in the OR cases from 87 to 91%. All these wonderful achievements. And what does that mean? It means better care for patients, better uh, response to what our patients need. It also means more resources because as these turnovers occur, we have more, we can use the room again for another case. And that's been very well received. We have lots of opportunities. Our budget for FY15 puts in reducing our length of stay some more, greater coordination of care through care management and care team processes, and future emphasis on reducing variability in care, uh, avoiding inpatient admissions when we can treat the patient better in an outpatient or other setting, even the home, and extending some of the great work that the Community Health Network uh, folks and Allison Glendening Napoli have been doing there and trying to look at how do we take out steps and redundancy and processes. You all, does any, or how many people in here do something every day that you think, gosh, we could make this more efficient? Aha. Uh -huh. We, that just shows you the opportunity that we have here. So we've got a lot of work to do, but the good news is, seeing all those hands, we kind of know what we need to start focusing on. We've become patient-centric, I said. We were going to fully engage our patients in their care, so what have we done? We engage patients in the wayfinding committee for selecting um, the, uh, for identifying wayfinding approaches in the new hospital and also selecting furniture. If you haven't had a chance to lie down for a couple of seconds, try out the new beds and the, uh, the family uh, uh, couches and beds that are out there in the foyer. We now have the single statement and access, uh, better access to uh, our MyChart. And we have uh, actually increased the things that our patients can do with my chart, from requesting appointments to paying their bill to printing their medication list, having their medical information accessible at all times. How great is that? No matter where I go, I can access my health information. If you have an iPhone, or if you have a phone, a smartphone, or an iPad, no problem, you can access um, your patient information. We also, um, Care Everywhere is going to let patients request, uh, uh, our physicians re we request charts, or the patient can authorize requesting their chart. Uh, so when I go on vacation and I'm in uh, uh, Madison, Wisconsin, in the summer, of course, um, <laughs> not this winter, uh, I can, if I get ill, I have my record with me. That's better for patients. We fully embraced a culture of trust was part of the vision. I think we still have a ways to go, but remember when I talked about those circles starting to blend across the, across the academic enterprise health system institutional support? Once we start engaging with everyone across the enterprise, and we realize that we're all here for the same reason, and that's to make UTMB a better place, whether it's for patient care, education, research, 
in support of that. We're all here for that common interest. I think our culture of trust will uh, continue to improve. We're trying to better integrate our physician colleagues and administrators into the planning and operations of the health system. We just implemented unit-based clinical leadership, a nurse physician dyad on each unit that uh, resembles our nurse physician dyad in our clinics to have uh, really this team approach to working in clinics and managing and care. We've got leaders participating in the leadership challenge. We have trained 251 people in crew resource management, the same systems that pilots use to avoid er errors in the aviation industry we're applying in high-risk areas and want to continue to roll that out. Uh, we also said that technology is going to support our work and make it safer, safer and reduce variation. Or how many of you happen to be in the technology visioning uh, groups that met? A number of us I know were. This was one of the ideas that came out of that. We wanted to implement barcode medication administration. We're going to launch that already, 2014. We're getting in May. And uh, this will cover more than 80% of all the medications that are uh, dispensed. And so what it does, I can scan my badge so we know who administered. I scan the patient's wristband and my giving this to the right patient, and then I scan the barcoded uh, medication, am I giving it to them, uh, to the right patient in the right dose, and then at the right time? That's going to, I've worked in organizations where this has been implemented, and I will tell you, our, my nursing the nursing colleagues I work with, they wouldn't do without it anymore because it is such an improvement to what we do. And then we've got some work we're doing around organizing some medical devices uh, to integrate data from these directly into the EPIC electronic record. So if you're monitoring your blood sugar, there would be a way to do it if you're a diabetic patient. We also have done some things around staff and provider productivity. Uh, we've been doing some optimization of EPIC, began the work in family medicine. Uh, we're getting positive feedback from that, so we're getting ready to schedule other uh, areas. We're going to be piloting EPIC Haiku and Canto. I think if I remember them right, Haiku is for your smartphone and Canto is for the iPad. So if you're a provider, a physician, or advanced practitioner, you can actually access EPIC EMR from your phone or your tablet. So that's also going to be kind of wherever you are with whatever technology you have, you would be able to do it. And then we're going to be implementing a nurse communication system because we've learned as we get the areas bigger and bigger and bigger, um, it's much more important to be able to communicate more easily than running down the hall to get that face-to-face. -face. Are you tired yet? <laughs> We implemented 59 new protocols into EPIC, meaning we're going to be consistent in the way we approach, let's say, a hip replacement. All the doctors, if you have an uncomplicated course of care, all the patients should be getting the same care, the same treatment by different physicians within that group or providers within that group. Uh, we, have, we will complete our EPIC clinic rollout in spring of 2015, and in honor of my good friend Ralph Farr, uh, former CIO, he and I used to laugh about this was, <laughs> Todd's laughing, the longest EPIC rollout known to man, but we're going to get that thing done finally. And then we have a lot of specialty modules that are going to be implemented. I see Dr. Endercroft here, and he's going to applaud that we're getting that blood bank donor module in. <laughs> and lots of other important systems that are going to improve care for our patients. So looking ahead, think now, how do I connect? I, hopefully you've been thinking about what you did to help some of that other work happen. I want you to think now about what you're doing to connect to the road ahead. We heard you when you said we need to communicate better in the health system. All of the things that are checked there, and I'm not going through all of those in the interest of time, we have been trying to do more and more work around that. 
We still want to hear your feedback. If there are other things we can do we haven't thought of, please email me. Uh, we want to be able to communicate in ways that are helpful to you. Um, you also said, um, when I work on my unit, I think you could do more to make me want to go above and beyond what's expected. So we've done some work around developing a reward and recognition program that we can apply consistently so everybody has the same approach to rewarding and recognizing employees. We're training man we've trained managers on how to provide appreciation through an organizational standard. Again, you think, well, shouldn't they do that? Well, of course, but I think there's so much variability. We're trying to make things consistent. Uh, you talked about, um, you know, you, wanted, you felt that staffing on your, in your areas was um, a, an issue, and so we have completed assessment of the staffing model, and we're making adjustments uh, through the budget process, and that will be communicated broadly. So lots of work trying to um, really take the UCount uh, survey very, very seriously. So your opinions matter. We're driving work around what you're telling us will make your work environment, environment a better place for you. So we have five pillars. People, our greatest asset. We're going to recruit, retain, and, and develop an engaged workforce, and we're going to do a number of things this year from hiring and retaining the right staff to creating an environment that focuses on improvement, trust, and open reporting of issues. In value, which changed from quality, because value, you know the equation for value? Quality plus cost equals value. And what do payers and patients expect from us? Value. So we're, we're looking at that pillar being different. We're going to achieve top quartile performance in safe, timely, efficient, effective, equitable patient-centered care, and we're going to assure we're patient-centered in all of our endeavors. We want to be the region's preferred integrated health system. And so when I told you we were looking at extending that model we're using with Angleton Danbury to other areas that are underserved that would like us in their community, we're going to be doing that. We want to optimize uh, allocating our resources so we can improve financial performance. And you may say, well, are we just going to focus on finance? I hope you heard. I left this toward the end because we really are going to focus on quality and satisfaction and all those things that will make us better. But the reality is we also have to know that our finances are important. And so we're going to be looking at how we can deploy technology, how we can do training, how we can create standards that will allow us to be a more cost-effective uh, health system. And lastly, we want to have strong collaborative relationships that improve the health of patients in our region. Uh, we're an academic institution. That's what our communities rely on us for, to make sure that we are contributing to the health in their community. And so we want to position UTMB as a resource in that work. I'm going to end with some people I ask ahead of time to be interviewed to tell us how their work makes a difference to patients. Just like that patient service specialist, I have read that letter in the beginning from that patient saying she basically probably saved, if she didn't save her life, she saved that woman from a lot more treatment. Um, I want you, as you listen to these wonderful people tell about the difference they're making, think about the difference you make in the lives of patients every day, because you know what? Everybody in here and everybody employed by UTMB does make a difference. We need to connect to that so we feel the passion and the sense of mission for what we're doing. So. I love working for UTMB. I love the people I work for, and I love the people I work with. Um, it's just like working with family. 
it, I feel really great about a lot of stuff I do there. I feel great about my patients. I feel great about my coworkers. And knowing I have coworkers who are there for me, that really does make me feel really great when I go home. I could have retired two years ago, but I really like what I do, people that I work with. They're nice, they're generous, they're kind, they're loving, caring. It's just heartwarming to work in a place like that. I work in a very small team. We're very cohesive. We have um, each other's back at any turn. They never let anyone fail. They never, if, if one person fails, we've all failed. You know, our staff are really our most valuable asset. Working together as a team is really important, and I feel that here at UTMB, we really do work together as a team to try to uh, give patients the best patient care possible. I think that's one of the nicest thing about being able to work with the different groups is you get to see all these different perspectives and it's very mind opening. They just love to do their job because the environment that they work in is a happy environment. And I walk around and greet all my employees every morning and say, hey, it's a great day today. Let's put a smile on our face and let's get ready to help the patients. You know, there's always a new opportunity, a new challenge. Um, and I appreciate you know the opportunity, those opportunities to be able to learn and grow. I've been somebody that's worked their way up through the ranks, and it just seems like the the opportunities have been limitless. From payment research, I became a senior payment research, and um, then now I'm the team lead for the department. It's just it's a, it's a life learning experience. Although I don't have direct patient contact, I provide the staff and the leadership with the data that they need to make informed decisions on where they can improve their processes to improve the patient care that we deliver. Developing patient education and making therapeutic recommendations for our drug formulary as well as developing evidence-based disease management guidelines, those are all things that I believe um, do make an impact on patient care um, and help to improve patient outcomes. You know, our job is actually very important. The nurses to take a big role, the doctors take a big role, but we take a big role too. Great service is what starts with us, and we want to make sure we have the best service. I go in and I do whatever the clinic needs, you know, take care of uh, things and uh, fix whatever needs to be fixed, whatever's asked of me, and, and that way that uh, the people can take care of the patients. I look at my patients as if it was my mother laying in that bed, as if it was my daughter just broke her arm or my daughter just found out she had cancer. I come to work knowing I'm a catering associate, knowing I do this for food and nutrition, but I'm also your friend. I'm also making sure everything's okay. I'm asking how your day is. It's not all about food sometimes. It's just the comfort. I demonstrate on a daily basis compassion toward the patients that I deal with. I respect them in every manner, and I always put integrity first. My challenge is making the unhappy customer happy. The patients come first. So if you're needed, the patients come first. And when I go home after a hard day's work, I think about my patients and the great recovery that they're going through. And when they come back for outpatient clinic, it's just beautiful to see them from the recovery. What motivates me is um, knowing that um, I've made a difference and patients are happy. And I can come home every day and say, I've done a good job. I, gave, I didn't only go to work to earn a paycheck, but I went to work knowing that I gave it my 100%. Knowing I put a smile on your face, knowing I, I cracked a joke with you, knowing I asked how your day's going, you tell me everything's fine. That really does make me feel really great about myself. It makes me feel proud to be part of UTMB when you have that kind of care and concern shown for you. We are all in it for the same reason, and that is to provide optimal patient care. Pretty powerful. All of you, um, I think could tell the same story. I wish we could have interviewed everybody in every kind of role. Um, we are, I know, running a little short on time. I want to give people, though, an opportunity, if you have a question, uh, to ask a question. And if not, we have one or two that uh, Subi George from the Employee Advisory Com 
council will ask. But first, let's give you all a chance. Any questions? And if you'd step forward to the mic, I'd appreciate it. The first question. The Night Nursing Council has been facilitating quarterly health promotion events in partnership with UTMB's health promotion team, which were very well received by the staff. It was brought to the council attention that although employees have been advised to step away from the work areas to take their breaks, there isn't a place to go to, especially for the night shift. A suggestion from the employees was that leadership consider looking into providing a relaxation room for the employees with some simple exercise equipment, a place where they can take a break and also feel safe. Thank you. Uh, we don't right now have that kind of space uh, in all of our units. Right now, especially on the inpatient setting, those areas are very crowded. One of the things that we look forward to on the inpatient side as we are able to move to the Jenny Seeley where we have created spaces for employees to go off stage, so to speak, on their units to get that needed break, we will be able to do when we also redo all of John Seeley. We also, as we have been moving forward with um, new clinics, every new clinic design has a place where the, where the employees can, again, go for, to step away for a break or for, uh, to eat. Uh, so it's not you know, being done sort of hit or miss in whatever room is available. Um, that is our goal, to make sure that we do have those spaces, um, but it won't be tomorrow, but I hope people are at least heartened by the fact that we are moving toward uh, doing that throughout as we complete a lot of these projects that I've been talking to you about today. Subi, one more question, then I think I'm going to let folks go, but we will be, if you have questions, if you would again uh, send them to uh, me so we can make sure we're going to collect them and put some responses as well. Um, and we also have an anonymous uh, website, don't we, Mary? Which is, tell me again, Health System Q&A. So if you go to that, you can send an anonymous email as well, and we can uh, look at that and try to respond. Okay, Subi, last one. Okay. I'm concerned that as leading institution, UTMB Galveston has not yet established a program that will assist clinical employees in pursuing a higher level of education while retaining the status as a full-time employee. The work school program, though no longer in existence, used to accommodate this need. It seems that other professionals seeking advancement has still been able to do so, either through online courses or altered work schedule. What is being done to provide the same opportunities for clinical employees? Um, that's, I think that's an excellent question. I'm going to let, I'm going to turn to my good friend Ron McKinley uh, to step up to the mic, if you will. Um, let me tell you, I do know there was a popular school at work program that was uh, funded by a grant uh, before I got here. Uh, I am very familiar with doing these kinds of programs. There is tuition reimbursement a system, a system to some extent that can be used, although we recognize it doesn't cover all of your tuition, but we are looking at ways we can actually improve this. And so Ron's going to tell you a little bit about some of the things we're doing. All right, so we will be implementing a new uh, school at work program beginning in FY15. Uh, that's in our uh, plan, and you'll be hearing more about it as we kind of firm those things up. Uh, and it's a program that's expandable over time. So I think it'll be uh, available for lots of different people uh, across disciplines, not only in the clinical arena. Okay, great, because I know there are people outside of the clinical arena. Um, first, I want to thank you for your time and attention today and for taking the time to actually uh, come and uh, listen and watch. And for those of you who joined uh, remotely, thank you for spending the time to attend. I hope if you take anything away from this, that you take away thinking about what some of those folks talked about and what difference am I making in the life of a patient today, this week, this month, in the coming year? What am I doing and how could I do that better? How could I talk to my colleagues about having that same sense of purpose and passion and enthusiasm for doing this work? Um, our patients, as the letter 
uh, that was sent to me that I read at the beginning. Our patients depend on it, and our patients appreciate it. So thank all of you for everything that you do every day to make UTMB a better and great place to work. I appreciate it.